Uh, the next speaker is Mike Arden Jones. Mike is Associate Professor at the University of Southampton. He's going to talk to us about prevention of an acute inflammatory dermatosis, of the fire risk of emollients, what dermatologists need to know. Thank you very much, Ian. <clears throat> Thank you to the organizers as well for inviting me to speak. Um, so I don't have any conflicts of interest relevant to this talk. Um, so the MHRA, the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Agency, has got uh, a number of objectives, but I'll highlight the bottom one, which is that if they know about a risk of some, something happening with a medicine, uh, they have to uh, uh, do something to reduce it and eliminate it as far as possible. Um, so this issue about fire risk came to light initially um, back in 2006. Well, it came to light before that, but it was really publicized broadly in 2006 when uh, an inpatient in a hospital with psoriasis uh, went out for a cigarette smoke and set himself on fire and died. Um, and the fact that he was covered in emollients at the time was, was linked with the, with the cause of the fire. As a consequence of that, the, uh, uh, there was various actions taken. But I wanted to just summarize uh, our knowledge as it, uh, before this lecture, if you don't mind. So if those of you who've got downloaded the app, if you can open the app and then quickly look at the three lines on the top left, click that and then click live quiz, I think it is, and, uh, and then you'll be able to answer these questions. So I'm hoping there's more than a couple of people who've got, have got this app. Let's have a go. The, uh, wh which emollients are a risk of fire? Um, so I'm just going to give you a few seconds to, to get the app open and then to, uh, to answer this question. Is it all emollients? Just the leave-on emollients and so not, for example, the shower or bath emollients? Is it all ointment emollients or uh, is there a paraffin uh, concentration? So if we, if we give you a few more seconds to answer that on your app. And then I will say we'll shut the quiz now and see how many people have actually answered. If you can display the data, please. Okay, so a bit of a mixed um, distribution of answers there. Um, oh, it's changing as we speak. <laughs> it doesn't tell us how many people have answered, but obviously it's more than a couple. So, okay, so we'll move on to the next talk, next slide. Um, so, which um, when are emollients a risk of fire? Is it when they're applied in large quantities, uh, when uh, they're freshly applied to skin, or when soaking through clothing, or when dried onto clothing? So if I just do a short, we'll make this quite quick if we can. So if we go five, four, three, two, one. Okay, if we get display the answers here. Okay, so again, mixed, mixed uh, sort of uh, interpretation of when emollients are a risk of fire. Okay, so if we move on to the next question now. Uh, what is required to ignite emollients? Can cigarette ash do it? Uh, infrared heat, naked flame, sunlight, or sparks. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and I think people have got a, got an indication of what's the, what's going to set these things on fire. And we'll we'll move on to the last question. I think there's one more. That's right. Which which risk minimization measures are effective? Uh, avoid smoking, use non-paraffin emollients, use water-based emollients, wash garments at uh, various temperatures, uh, which would you recommend? So again, if we can do that quite quickly, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we'll see the answers that people have put. Okay, avoid smoking, there's a lot of, lot of answers there. Okay, I'm gonna touch on all these qu questions and hopefully give you answers to these during the rest of the talk. So if we can move back to the talk now, please. Okay, so um, yeah, so back in 2006, there was that fire fatality that I mentioned, um, and as a consequence, uh, there was a national uh, patient safety agency alert to this issue, uh, a risk of uh, fire with emollients, and there was a rapid response published that I've put on the right-hand side of the screen there, and there was a, an alert made to creams containing uh, more than, or ointments more than 50% paraffins. Um, and uh, you will probably recognize a number of these symbols that were displayed in various dermatology departments and also onto the packaging for a number, for a number of emollients. So this was all seen as, as you know, a positive response to this type of issue, um, and, uh, and we as a community were alert to it. Uh, and um, the problem was that, in fact, mo uh, uh, it was very heterogeneous which um, 
uh, companies actually put the, the warnings on their products. And so there was a lot of unhappiness across the industry that some companies, if you like, were playing the game and others weren't. So there was unhappiness, if you like, with this, with this approach anyway. And that was back in 2007. So the next uh, sort of evolution over the, since then, um, there was um, it's a number of fire deaths uh, that were linked with uh, emollients. And these weren't just sort of linked by anyone. They were actually in the coroner's inquests linked to, um, to, to the risk of uh, uh, emollient application causing or playing a strong role in the etiology of the fire. And when coroners identify something that's a risk for, 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 the, for the death or that's potentially reversible, they have to issue what's called a preventing future deaths report. And that is directed to whatever agency, whatever government agency needs to take responsibility for it. So in this case, it was directed to the MHRA. And uh, so you can see here the, gov the coroner has identified that it, in, these, in some cases where there was a lower um, uh, exposure to paraffins than the 50% rule, um, there was a fire risk there. And, uh, and they were concerned that healthcare professionals may not be aware of that and that there was no labelling on the products to inform the consumer. So this was sent to the MHRA and they were, the MHRA were told to act on it uh, and a number of other reports. So um, uh, this was in, at the same time um, uh, following a, a death in West Yorkshire. Uh, the West Yorkshire Fire Service uh, started to publicise this risk because they felt there was something they could do about it. And this was picked up by the national press. Uh, and you can see here when they started to look at the, the risk of, of fire and, and emollients. So what I wanted to show you, so, so West Yorkshire actually went, went out, um, really impressively went out and did some research. So they said, okay, well, what is the real risks to, with these products? Uh, and they did some fire testing. And I'm going to show you a little video here uh, of the, the firemen lighting these uh, cotton uh, um, uh, materials, either untreated or treated with paraffin uh, and left to dry uh, at different concentrations uh, or washed following application of the paraffin uh, at, at 40 degrees centigrade. And, uh, and so I'm going to show you uh, what happens. So you can see here that um, even after three seconds, uh, the paraffin uh, cotton fabrics are well alight. And, um, uh, and the washed products are showing much bigger flames compared to the uh, untreated controls. Uh, and by 30 seconds, you'll see that it's pretty substantial fire. Uh, going on, so um, I won't dwell on this. It's pretty obvious what the conclusion from that type of uh, study was. Um, so uh, what the MHRA took this information uh, on board and said um, they wanted to set up an expert group to advise them on how to respond, and I was asked to chair it, which is why I'm here today. Um, and we had a great um, set of people involved from all different stakeholders um, to help us try and understand what, what this uh, issue was about. Uh, what, what were the benefits and risks of emollients? Should we restrict use of emollients? Um, what, what regulatory action should be taken? What studies are required? Uh, and what, what uh, communication about the risks need to be made? And how do we monitor whether we've done any good? So we first of all wanted to understand what was the real evidence for this being a real thing? Is it actually a thing? And the MHRA reported uh, on 11, well, they had 11 cases, which they knew definitely there had been a proper link made between the risk of home fire death and uh, emollient application, of which five were directly from the coroners. Now, the fire services, I mentioned West Yorkshire already, um, but there was also a, a couple of cases in London. And so the London Fire Service and the West Yorkshire Fire Service became alert to this problem fairly early on in the story. And suddenly, the, their team started to sort of look, when they went to home fires, for any evidence of, uh, of whether emollients could be playing a role here. And so in, in, it was a very, you know, not, not a trial in any sense of the word, but they both reported 50 fire incidents um, where they linked emollients with the, with the fire, home fire. Now, we recognised in the MHRA that actually this has got two problems. One is it could be a massive overestimate if the uh, fireman saw a pot of emollient next to the next to the person or in the area where the person had uh, had, a, had a fire. Uh, you know, could they really be sure that was playing a role? And the other possibility is the fact that there was only two fire services uh, reporting this uh, and nothing from any of the other fire services. It's possible. In fact, there's a massive underreporting because the other fire services just weren't aware. So we couldn't really decide really uh, where the uh, wh what the exact absolute risk was with the, that, that's known. Um, so um, uh, we also asked for further evidence. Was, was the, uh, we heard um, that there were some 
um, uh, organizations asking people to avoid use of paraffin emollients. And so we asked Anglia, Anglia Ruskin University, who've got a forensic uh, lab, to undertake some further fire tests. And I'll show you here the, uh, uh, one of the assessments they did where they compared uh, a non-paraffin cream with uh, a paraffin cream and, uh, and blank cotton. And you can see uh, very rapidly uh, a fire you know, taking hold in this uh, dried on emollient um, as compared to the blank cotton where the, where the flame is, uh, Bunsen burner flame is carrying on here, but it's still yet to ignite. Uh, and so strikingly, uh, there didn't seem, you know, we haven't obviously analyzed every type of non-paraffin emollient, but there didn't seem to be a, a, a definite rule of thumb that by just avoiding paraffin emollients removed the risk. So um, in summary, to cut all this evidence, a uh, long story short, if you like, what we identified was that uh, through fire testing, fresh emollient is not flammable. This is a big misunderstanding that's out there. In other words, the, the products themselves are, have, have contain water, and the water itself usually it makes it non-flammable. And it's the evaporation of that water when the emollient uh, dries onto a clothing uh, that, it, that it actually becomes flammable. The emollient on skin is not flammable, partly because the water is still there, partly because your skin's got plenty of water in it, but also you need an ignition temperature, uh, and the skin is very good at, sorry, they're very good at dissipating the, the heat of that ignition, so actually uh, you're unlikely to achieve an adequate ignition, to ignition temperature just by uh, on your skin. So it's on clothing that the problem happens, and when that emollient is dried into clothing. And a naked flame is required to ignite it. You can go up to these things with a, with a glowing cigarette, and it, they don't light with that. They don't light with uh, uh, sparks. Uh, they don't light with uh, ash, and they don't light with, uh, so obviously, obviously uh, infrared or sunlight. Um, and that there didn't seem to be any clear-cut distinction in, in the preliminary studies between non-paraffin and paraffin emollients. So we insisted that the advice had to be to all emollients. And furthermore, I've uh, shown you some data on the washing that, uh, that there was some evidence that washing a very hot temperature, which uh, would shrink many types of clothing and bandages and things, um, uh, will uh, re remove the emollient, but uh, at the average uh, temperatures that are used, uh, then, uh, then it didn't remove the risk. And noticeably that the uh, concentration of paraffin as well was hugely important in, in that uh, a lower dose of paraffin burnt twice as fast as a, a control uh, a bit of gar a garment, and, and that when you have the paraffin in there, it burns a huge amount hotter. So not, not only is any fire you induce more likely, but it burns much quicker, and it's much hotter. So it probably explains the association with some of these uh, casualties. So um, we, we, we acknowledge that the risk was uh, there, but it seemed to be at least very rare. However, obviously in those incidents, there are devastating consequences. And the at-risk populations are those where there's large areas of skin treatment, clearly because it absorbs into the, into the bandages, into the clothes, or into whatever the uh, person's uh, wearing. Uh, and clearly repeated impregnation is a risk too. Uh, so one of the fire deaths was a patient who was using re regular shower emollients, and he'd always wear the same toweling dressing gown out of, uh, after he came out of the shower and, uh, and, and use that to dry himself off. And, and actually, he, he, uh, uh, he, he had died, unfortunately, in a fire incident, and they, uh, that some of the toweling dressing gown was left, uh, and they were able to do fire tests to prove that that was uh, uh, part of the uh, increased um, uh, flammability. Um, so reduce, it is reduced by washing or changing clothes, but if you don't do that, uh, then you're increasing the risk. Older patients, uh, most of the cases reported are in the older group, uh, and those with impaired mobility clearly can't take off the, of any burning items quickly. Uh, and, uh, and if they're bed-bound, then they're more at risk, obviously, if they're smokers as well. Um, any exposure to natural flames, which are obvious things, and other factors for home fire. So these are the risk populations. And um, so we... we had to advise our, our, our report to the Commission for Human Medicines, and we said that clearly we didn't see any need for a restriction of emollient use. We definitely didn't want that to happen. They're really important emollients. Uh, and that we thought that the main thing we had to do was at least try and uh, communicate to people that if you've got these things, uh, that you should be aware there is a fire risk. And, and, and to understand the nuanced risk, because that's what the problem is, that this is a misinterpretation of how that risk actually arises. Um, and not only in patients, but also amongst clinicians, uh, and that we wanted to risk, try and reduce the risk by applying these labels and to make the uh, guidance reflect all emollients, but including other things uh, that may need uh, individual risk-based assessments like head lice uh, treatments, for example. So the Commission for Human Medicines approved our recommendations and they've asked 
to uh, in, uh, design a label and adjust the patient information leaflets of the summary product uh, characteristics. And they asked us to ar arrange a communication strategy um, uh, which we recognize that patients just throw the packaging away or they don't even look at the bottle. Uh, so it's no good just putting a little label on. And so the communication strategy has to be more. So direct to the public uh, uh, and also to healthcare providers, an immediate response, which I'll show you in a second, and also a more long-term plan, tar targeted and non-targeted, and of course, in, in balance of the, the relatively rare risk, this unfortunately would have to be low, quite low cost. We need to measure the uh, risk minimization uh, effectiveness and see, and see how what other, what other things need to be done. So this was the logo that was designed, and it's not a fire warning. It doesn't say fire because that, that implies flammability, and that sort of perpetuates this misunderstanding about these products being flammable in their own right. So it tries in as simple a way as possible to identify the risk, which is this issue of drying onto uh, clothing uh, and then becoming a, f a fire risk. And, that's, and then there's a, a, a flash on the front of the products that is uh, get, warning the consumer that they, uh, there's a new information on this, on this product. Um, and fortunately, the MHRA, which regulates medicines, has been able to uh, use an industry-wide body to actually ho hopefully get all the, the players, because you might be aware that many emollients are registered as medicines and many are m medical devices and some are cosmetics. And so the devices and cosmetics groups don't have to follow MHRA advice, but we've, we've created an industry-wide consortium to try and hope, hope that everybody plays the game, if you like, and, and so there's not some uh, groups trying to take advantage of not putting on this label and say that their product is safer. So these sorts of things go into the information about the product. Uh, again, it's the nuanced explanation of when the risk arises, and so that's what we're trying to get across. And this was announced in the um, drug safety update just before Christmas last year, and, uh, and that was picked up in national media. And we were quite pleased. I don't know how many of you noticed this. We're quite pleased that the press were very responsible, actually, and did try and give uh, a real uh, honest sort of appraisal of where the risk lay and not be too uh, sort of uh, excitable about it, if you like. So I'm just going to finish off with a little video of um, uh, the daughter of one of the um, patients, um, Brian Beacat, who really started the, a lot of the interest from West Yorkshire off uh, as a powerful... He was using emollient creams. He had a ulcer on his leg, which was very painful, and the creams really helped. So he was using them, and he was using it in the shower as well. He, uh, we think he went onto the balcony for a cigarette uh, in his dressing gown and pyjamas, and um, somehow set himself on fire, and then couldn't get it out quickly enough to avoid the third degree burns, which killed him 14 hours later. So you can understand why um, his daughter is quite an advocate for saying, well, wh why didn't anybody know about this? He didn't know there was a risk. I didn't know there was a risk. So you can understand why uh, consumer groups are quite uh, keen to, to, to make this more visible. But of course, there's still a huge amount of misinformation out there, and that's one of the roles of this talk, which I was asked to do that by the MHRA. Um, so there's OPUS, which are so-called ex experts in, in, in drugs, uh, and, and they, they've identified the risks relating to this press release we put out in December, and they're saying paraffin-based emollient creams are incredibly flammable. So wrong at all sorts of levels. And then there's an example of a, a district prescribing committee uh, where, you know, if you identify a patient who's maybe got some of these risk factors for home fire, switch them away from paraffin containing emollients to emollients that are water-based, such as aqueous cream. So many levels of wrongness, even the sort of efficacy data, if you like. So there's, so there's a lot of misunderstanding out there, and that's why I'm hoping... Uh, we'll all get on the same page after this talk, hopefully. So I'm hoping that you'll feel that as dermatologists, what we should do is at least know what the evidence is, be able to yeah, explain that the risk is low, but understand that risk, uh, and, and identify high-risk individuals. We probably do come across them in our practice, um, and then probably uh, we should be thinking about how do we risk minimise and we should act as advocates for emollient use, because I'm hearing quite a lot of reports all around the country of people misinterpreting these warnings and, uh, and trying to either ban emollients or ban paraffin emollients or other things. So we need to be advocates and explain uh, the detail of this uh, issue and challenge misinformation and misunderstanding. And of course, if you do come across a case of a fire associated with emollient use, don't forget to yellow card it, because we do need to record these things. Um, so I'd like to particularly acknowledge the MHRA who... 
uh, have been superb in, in sort of supporting this, this working group. Um, and on the panel, as well as all the members of the panel, but particularly um, Mike Cork and uh, Celia Moss uh, from the BAD, then Sarah Hall from the Anglia Ruskin and Chris Bell from West Yorkshire. Um, so uh, I'd like to acknowledge them. Thank you very much. We've got time for one comment only, please. Uh, microphone one. Um, Mike, thanks. That was great. Look, so I, I put emollient on my son um, every night. Uh, he's eight. I don't think he's smoking in bed. Um, I'm just the practicalities. You say that the washing machine doesn't remove stuff. I mean, if, how, how much do you reduce the accumulation of emollients at 40 degrees, at 60 degrees, shrinking the bedding at 90 degrees? Should I replace the bedding in his pajamas every month? You know, how, how much benefit would you get from those things? Well, I think the two issues are, what, well, I mean, the evidence at the moment is still limited. So we, I showed you some of the data there, but there isn't uh, a stack of data on, on, on exactly what temperature is required. So that's one of the things that we recognize we need to do more on. Um, and, and I think but the, the risk of minimization with your son is, is more about flame, isn't it? I mean, that whenever they're, you know, person exposed to emollients on their clothing is... Uh, you know, if you if you if you if you can avoid flame, the problem's non-existent. So I, I, I think that you know it, it's it's uh, you know when you think about it in detail, like that, it does you do start to worry. But actually, when you, in reality, it's it's low risk. But you know, hopefully, he's not in his pajamas playing by your open fire, Richard, in the in the sh in the castle in uh, just outside Edinburgh. <laughs> Mike, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.